So if you feel like you want to progress with your running, but your body size, you feel like you're a big guy, whether that means tall, whether that means heavy, whatever that means to you is holding you back, perhaps that's through injury or simply the effort and the recovery you need after running, I've got five tips that will help you specifically improve things like your running style and your training plan to, as a heavier runner, improve with your running over time so that you can hit your running goals. And the first of these tips that I want to talk about specifically is running technique. And who here, we've got a bunch of people live here on the chat, um, who's not surprised that I'm getting straight into running technique. This is kind of my thing a little bit. We're gonna talk about other aspects. Um, running form is such a big topic and there's so much we can cover, there's so much we can cover, but I think a key point of this that I want to get across is the fact that when it comes to your running form and how heavy it feels underfoot and how heavy it sounds underfoot, and again, in the comments, let me know if you hear yourself as a kind of a heavy runner, um, you know, making this kind of thumping as you're running, that has nothing to do with your body weight. Your body weight has a lot to do with the experience that you're, well, with the loading that your joints experience and your muscles and tendons experience, for sure. You know, someone who's like me, heavy guy, um, you know, 200 and between 225 and 250 pounds, depending on where I'm at at my training, um, that naturally is going to put more stress and strain on my knees and my calves and my hips and my lower back than it is my partner, Holly, who's five foot four, she's a dancer, she weighs very little. Clearly that's gonna be different, but how you control your body weight, the control there and the ability to run light is all about, well, exactly that. It's all about the control and the technique you use. Okay, so I can, given that I'm naturally going to have to carry that little bit more weight, I can still run in such a way which puts less stress and strain on my joints in comparison to if I were to run with perhaps a sloppier running technique where I'm overstriding, heavily heel striking, running with a low cadence, so long strides, long contact time, which is naturally going to take my body weight and put a lot more um, kind of multiple of that body weight through my joints every time my foot strikes the ground. So simple things, and you hear me talk about this all the time, things like cadence, are really, really important in terms of how quickly you turn your feet over. You should be able, as a big guy, to naturally feel like you can play with the rate at which those legs turn over and naturally shorten up your strides, shorten the contact time to a point where it feels like you're making shorter, quicker strides and it's lighter underfoot. This is nothing new. This isn't something that you've probably never heard before. Okay, this is, talking about cadence has been done to death. Instead, I want to talk about what happens to your body when you start manipulating cadence. And that's really, really important because it's a trade-off. Again, I mentioned this in a previous video, but the trade-off is for us bigger guys, bigger girls, essential. Because if we are running with your, your typical heavy overstriding heel strike with a big impact, a big, um, what we refer to as a transient impact that happens as soon as the foot strikes the ground in that overstriding position, then you're going to find that the majority of that force is absorbed by joints like the knees and the hips. And there we go, Mary's just jumped straight in here and said, your knees and feet hurt when you run. So this is absolutely kind of what we're talking about here. It is all about understanding that if you run in one way, it's going to put more stress and strain on your knees. If you run in a different way, so with shorter contact, uh, shorter contacts, shorter strides, lighter a lighter feeling underfoot because of a higher cadence that force isn't going anywhere specifically okay so remember what we you were probably taught in high school you can't just get rid of a force instead we transfer forces what you end up doing is you end up in a position where that force is more experienced at the ankle and applied to the calf and the achilles unit and that is where a lot of runners particularly us big guys need to consciously make that trade-off do we want, for me, do I want to run around putting 250 pounds, stride after stride, or multiples of 250 pounds, because of course you're taking multiple times body weight through that landing foot and up through the chain. Do I want to do that with a heavy heel strike that's going to be placing it on the knees? Or do I want to take the time to build a strong set of calves and a strong Achilles, a whole plantar flexor unit, and really condition that over time to be able to do what it's, it's there for, what it's be able to do in terms of um, 
in terms of absorbing that um, that you know, plantar flexor that plantar flexor load. I would argue the latter. We see lots of guys running around who struggle with knee pain because one way or another, they're quite heavy guys, whether that means they're tall, whether that means they're overweight, it's a lot of weight to carry. So think about shortening up your stride, increasing your cadence, but taking the time in doing that. There's actually a video linked down in the description which talks about how to increase your cadence. David Hammond makes a great point though. Okay, so David says you don't see too many guys with a 180 cadence. Now, there's actually a video which I released maybe six weeks ago, something like that, which the title is something along the lines of the, the problem with the 180 cadence magic number or whatever it was, something along those lines. And that video talks about why 180 really isn't that good a kind of magic number for us all to try and aim towards. And I think actually there was a, uh, well, where have I put it? Hmm, somewhere I've got a, that's not the one, we're gonna to come to these in a second. Here we go, so we've got a comment from the Facebook group, because I asked about uh, you know, other people's experiences of, of being heavy runners. Um, this commenter says, I'm six foot two, so you've got a long stride length and find this affects your cadence. Um, you're a 140 half marathon runner, 43 10K runner, but even racing you struggle to hit 180, usually more like 172, 174. So we wouldn't say I'm inefficient, but would like to regularly hit 180 so as to go quicker. Okay, I would argue that probably increasing your cadence in that instance isn't where you're going to find the, um, the answer to run quicker because as a taller guy, being in the 172, 174, 176 kind of range, if you have got quite long legs, that's probably where you're going to default to unless you're doing something like 400s, 800s, those kind of more high-end, fast speed efforts. Naturally, I would rather see someone there trending towards 180 rather than being where I see a lot of runners, particularly us guys, particularly tall guys, who have a tendency to be down in the low 160s. If you're in the low 160s, you may be dealing with knee pain, that's where I'd look to increase cadence. Someone like, um, someone like this commenter um, that we've just talked about, I would look at more like finding your stride length from the right place. Again, look up the video, how to increase your stride length from me on YouTube, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. They're running from the hips rather than just simply relying on increasing your rate of turnover. Hope that makes sense. So essentially we're looking to get you making shorter, quicker strides, but feeling lighter underfoot. Now let's have a quick look at, um, here we go. Uh, Lassie says, what, do you do if your calves tighten up? Conditioning, uh, your conditioning can easily run 10 miles, but your legs stop me, you're uh, six foot five. What's that, six foot five and 92 kilos. Okay, so this is something I've had to learn as well in terms of, um, in terms of looking after, particularly looking after my calves. I've mentioned the trade-off, and this trade-off is real, this trade-off is really important. Yes, there's a benefit from moving the, the stress and strain away from your knees, but in the way in which those calves are going to take more strain when you move more towards a four-foot strike, if you go long, and I've had to learn this with some of my longer runs, or all of my longer runs as well over the years, I've had to learn that scaling back so that I'm not running right up on my forefoot, but instead I'm allowing the heel to come and touch the ground. So I land with the balls of my feet first, and then the heel comes and touches. That does just enough to take a little bit of that excess demand off the calves. So... If you are a, um, a runner who's you know, you've tried to get further up onto your forefoot and you're finding that that's, while it feels great, it feels light, it feels springy, the knees are, are much happier, but the calves are hating you, give yourself that opportunity just to, to ease back. Okay, so let's have a quick look. Um, can you trust cadence data from your watches or is a metronome the best way? Again, depends on the units. Um, I like checking in with a metronome every now and again, certainly, but I do find, you know, I just use Garmin 235, and I find that the cadence data with that is pretty spot on. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be pretty happy looking at that. I think they use, I think they're just using a simple acceler accelerometer in there, which is just gonna be, hopefully, fairly accurate. Right, I might be wrong, by the, by the way. If anyone knows how, how Garmin's work, then, by all means, put me right. I've got uh, 
That's not my thing by any means. Um, right, moving on from, from technique, because that was the first point I wanted to make. If you found that interesting, if you found that helpful, just hit the like button. And, uh, and of course, let me know if you've got any specific thoughts, questions, and experiences you wanted to share down in the comments. Second point I wanted to talk about was actually your recovery um, and making sure that as whether it's a, a taller guy, whether it's a heavier guy, whether it's you know, someone who's overweight, whatever it is, if you're carrying more weight, you need to be thoughtful, not just about the mileage you're doing. I mentioned earlier that my last kind of real successful for me marathon that I did, I was up in the kind of the 50s, 60s, um, and at times tapping on almost 70 mile weeks at 225 uh, pounds, keep on wanting to say 225 kilos, clearly that's wrong, 225 pounds, um, I was managing to get that mileage in without breaking down, fantastic, but I had to be smart about how I was doing that. Okay, A lot of the time, if we simply try and follow a plan which is perhaps made for a runner with a completely different body shape, completely different body type, then you might find that you're not giving yourself the recovery that you need. Getting that kind of mileage in, and I'm not saying that's what everybody needs to do, not even nearly. Whether you're running 15, 20 miles a week, 30 miles a week, whatever, that's fine, absolutely fine. But if you're trying to spread out as you're increasing your mileage, if you're trying to spread out your runs across the week and running kind of six day weeks, um, or in some cases running seven day weeks, I would by all means, um, I by all means suggest being a little bit more strategic about trying to ring fence a little bit more rest in the week. And the way I did that was by actually blocking into bigger runs in the week, my mileage, so that I, at one point, I was actually making sure that in the week, every run I did was, because I knew I needed to get the mileage in, every run I did was upwards of 10 miles. Now that's not for everybody, not at all, but I feel like the philosophy is, because what that allowed me to do was to get the mileage in, but keep the frequency of running down. So I only had to do so many runs per week, which meant I could spread those runs out. So whether I was going out for a 10 miler or going out for a 14 miler, I had significant time since the last run to allow my body to recover and adapt, because it had a lot of weight to carry around after, uh, carry around as you, were, as you were running, so it needed afterwards to be able to actually get a proper amount, a proper duration of recovery in before the next run. If I was simply trying to go out and run double, double run days, or if I was going out and trying to um, just do shorter runs in the week, but more of them, I personally believe, for my body, that it's more stressful to do a four mile run, a six mile run, and a 10 mile run, than it is to do a 10 mile run, a rest day, and a 10 mile run. Does that make sense? I hope, that, I hope you see where I'm coming from with that. I think making sure I can really force that recovery by making the runs more meaningful makes a real difference. And it cuts out, I don't like the term anymore, junk miles. I used to use it a lot more, but I don't tend to use it so much these days. Cutting out junk miles, absolutely, absolutely key. Um, so yeah, there's the frequency side of things. The other side, of course, is the intensity side of things, which we'll come on to in a second. That's more true, really, for, for all runners when we talk about the, the intensity side. Um, shoes, I'm not going to talk. So Edmund asks, am I going to talk about the sort of shoes that you should use? I'm not going to talk specifically about... Um, not to, we're going to talk specifically about brands and models and you know, use this, use that. And in fact, I use a plethora of different shoes because I like to kind of get into a good routine of running shoe rotation. And I'm quite lucky that I don't seem to be very sensitive when it comes to footwear choices. Um, but I will talk about that uh, in a second when it comes to talking about gear in general. Um, my own challenges, that is, in terms of footwear. There are two types that I really want to to talk about in terms of uh, in terms of footwear for us bigger guys very broad kind of topic very broad types that i want to highlight for different purposes so one if we're talking about the longer run and your long so your longer runs in the week i would actually suggest looking for something with a little bit more cushioning um now whether you're going down the hooker route or something like that more max maximalist type route again that's more that's more for you um that's more for you to take a look at it's not something we're going to talk about today but for your longer runs, perhaps something with a little bit more cushioning may not go amiss at all. 
However, that said, I also like the other end of the spectrum for some of those shorter runs, think about maybe experimenting with something with a little bit less of a midsole, a little bit more like a racing flat, something, you know, again, that could mean many different things to many different people, but I like something more like the like, kind of a Saucony Kinovara or something like that. So four mil drop. Yes, it's still got a reasonable midsole, but it's not as thick as, um, as some of your more traditional shoes because that's going to help you feel underfoot a little bit better and learn to run a little bit lighter underfoot with what we were talking about in point one, which was light, uh, higher cadence, lighter contact, shorter contact, um, thinking about making those shorter, quicker strides. You'll find it easier to learn to do that, in some cases, in slightly lighter weight footwear, more kind of racing flat style footwear. Those who want to go out and out minimalist, go for it. That's on you. Um, but again, for me, just starting to mix it up, there's a lot of benefit there, certainly. But give your body what it needs in terms of perhaps a little bit more cushioning for those longer runs for that increased mileage. Now, um, right... Let's get back on track a little bit. So there was something else I wanted to talk about um, in terms of the comments before I moved on to my list. Uh, if I find it, I will, uh, I'll come back to that. Um, right, intensity. Shoes, quickly, actually, while we're still on shoes, let's talk about um, just the benefit of just starting to perhaps replace your shoes that little bit quicker. As a heavier guy, I do find that I wear through my shoes that little bit faster. Again, depends on what you're wearing. You may or may not find the same, but I certainly have to retire my running shoes a little bit quicker than a lot of other, other um, runners might have to. So again, that kind of sucks from a cost point of view, but it's something that I do find I, I have to kind of take on the chin a little bit. And naturally, I find that I end up with more shoes to uh, to kind of wear here at the studio and, and effectively kind of use as slippers. But yeah, in terms of shoes I'm actively training in, I do burn through them, I think, a little bit quicker than I would do if I was, I don't know, 100, 170 pounds rather than 225 pounds. Um, right. The next point I wanted to make was all about intensity of your training. And the intensity of your training is super important. We talked about the free, we, we spoke about the frequency earlier, making sure you're leaving adequate gaps in between your training if you are a heavier runner, so your body gets a little bit more time to recover. And that shouldn't stop you from being able to get your mileage in, but you need to just chunk that mileage differently. The intensity is super important because we need to be able to specifically recover between those hard sessions and those long sessions. Okay, so the extensive and the intensive workouts. Simple rule, which I do try and apply to as many runners as possible rather than just us heavy guys and girls, is to just try and keep those separated in the week as much as physically possible. So doing something like your long run on a, a long run on a Sunday, followed by either doing a Wednesday or Thursday speed session, that I'd be much happier than doing Sunday, Tuesday, for example. That's a fairly simple concept and something hopefully that doesn't take too much explaining, but they're the sorts of sessions that are gonna take it out of you the most and give you the longer, uh, take you the longer to recover from. So let's give yourself the opportunity to do exactly that by spacing them out within the week. The last point I wanted to make was all about cross training. And making sure that, again, listening to your body, if you feel like your shins or your plantar fascia or your knees are starting to object, and that is quite often the areas that in us kind of bigger, heavier runners, they are the areas that quite often do start to object, perhaps go from four runs a week to three runs a week and add in a session on the bike or a session in the pool or a session on the cross trainer. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And ultimately, we do need one way or another to make sure we're getting the particularly aerobic workouts in the cardio benefit of whether it's running or whether it is um, work on the bike, work on the rower, work in the, in, the, in the pool, whatever it is. It's all, if we're looking just to build aerobic base, it's all going to be beneficial. Just that extra session is going to be much lower load zero impact in most cases in comparison to the load that would come from adding an extra run in the week. So again, think of that as an opportunity to, over time, build your running mileage, build your running tolerance. So you might start with doing three runs a week, and then you know you want to do five runs a week. So you actually do three runs a week and two cross training sessions, to then do four runs a week, and then one cross training session, and then do eventually five runs 
per week. And that, that could take you six months to build that up. Because as you're working through that, not only are you building tolerance to running, your body will be changing. Okay, you'll be, yes, you'll be starting to become more resilient in certain areas, stronger in certain areas, but you'll also feel as you know, you'll experience a, a degree of weight loss, especially if your nutrition's on point as well. And I'm not a nutrition guy, that's not my thing. Um, but if you have that covered, then you will see the benefits, no doubt. Um, okay, Askor says, big fan of the channel. Um, you started running what, uh, again one and a half months ago. You love the exercises that you're showing the videos. My friend, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I love the fact that you're here um, as a subscriber to the channel and enjoying the channel. I really, really hope that those, vid that those videos and those exercises are helping you out. No doubt they are. But um, yeah, best of luck with your running. Okay. Let's have another look through the comments, see what else we've got. Any other questions I can answer quickly. Um, right. Guys, if you found this helpful, by the way, let me know um, and just hit the like button. That will give me the feedback I need to know that this was a, a beneficial session and a helpful topic for you all. Uh, and feel free to let me know in the comments as well if there are any other comment, any other topics you'd like me to cover as, uh, as we do more of these in the future. Um, right, quickly skimming through these comments. Uh, Carl is also a cyclist. Hopefully that will really help. Let's have a look at the main comments he said. Um, 182 tall and 86 kilos. You suffer from knee pain occasionally and uh, calf and shin pains. Bit of a heel striker, trying to move more midfoot. I think the last run was about 172. Okay, good, so you're not in a bad ballpark in terms of cadence, by all means. Um, in terms of... Yeah, in terms of calf pain, shin pain, knee pain, the big thing to get across here, and this is something that from a technique perspective, I, I probably should say more, is that technique's super important, right? Technique is a big, important part of injury prevention, but it's not the biggest. The biggest part of preventing running injuries is avoiding training errors. Okay, so again, Carl, I don't know anything about your training plan, but... It may well be that you need to take a look at how you're spacing out the mileage in the week, how you're piecing that together, um, and perhaps think about keeping a training diary. Um, I don't know, you know, you're a cyclist as well, I don't know if you use training peaks or anything like that, but have a look at just making notes in terms of where and when you feel those aches and pains, because being specific about knowing what kind of patterns start to occur and knowing what that means against your, your mileage or the types of sessions you're doing might help you get to the bottom of what the problems are. And of course, on top of that, getting on top of some real solid strength and conditioning work is really, really important. Um, there are a couple of points I wanted to look at in terms of questions. Um, right, I feel like I've covered this one in terms of uh, in terms of preparing for a marathon and making sure that I'm really starting to, like I said, space those miles, the, that mileage out in the week rather than simply um, you know, simply adhering to a more kind of standard marathon training plan. Again, that won't be for everyone, but the approach I took of not doing, in my bigger weeks, not doing anything, not doing any run less than 10 miles, so I was doing less runs in the week, but each of them were longer, really worked for me. Um, and the following question to this one was, do I think that carrying weight over distance and, and, uh, and the increased speed that goes with trying to PB um, is going to cause you problems later in the race? And what would you do in training to help? So lots of race pace work, race pace work in your long runs. Um, yes, you know, it's physics. You know, you're, gonna, you're carrying more weight over a longer distance. You're out on your feet for longer. It's going to be a tough day out. So hopefully, along with your marathon training, might come a little bit of weight loss. Perhaps look at some fasted runs, some fasted long runs. That will certainly help make the weight drop straight off me. Um, that's how I got from that 250 to 225. And funnily enough, how I got from 225 back to 250. But... That's another conversation. Um, but yes, the more weight you're carrying around, the harder that latter stage of the, the run is going to be. So on one hand, do something about the weight. On the other hand, let's get you practicing and building the strength for those longer runs. The last part of those long runs, perhaps look at doing some some um, some back-to-back -back long runs, big run, big run weekends, those sorts of things. Um, that's perhaps a topic for another day. Okay, so this is the last comment I wanted to look at. So, large lady struggling with two days in a row. Again, we mentioned this earlier. And you start doing some strength work. Strength work will certainly help. Building up that resilience, building up uh, your, your, your ability to tolerate the loading. Um, but more the kind of the first world problems of finding running gear that is appropriate for your size is a problem. Now, I'm not going to get into where specifically to look for different uh, different types of running gear. 
But I do want to just acknowledge that for those, again, like me, I've got size 14, UK size 14 feet. That makes it really hard to find the running shoes I want to run in. Um, and in fact, I'm very lucky because I do seem to be able to tolerate lots of different types of running shoes. I know other runners who, if, if ASICs changed the shoe significantly from one model to the next, or one release of the next, or the same model rather, then they completely, they're completely scuppered. It's a real problem. They're so sensitive to running shoes. Thank God I'm not. Because if I was, the, the, uh, the way in which I had to kind of take what I can get when it comes to running shoes in size 14 would be a real problem. So I know this is true for a lot of us, but the point I wanted to make really when it comes to your running gear as a bigger runner is find something. If we're looking beyond shoes, make sure what you're running in is comfortable. Don't settle. Okay, find something that makes you happy, that makes your body happy. Um, I've been through the process of feeling lots of chafing in certain areas um, and you know, running t-shirts, which are just a bit too small, which get me under the armpit, all those sorts of things, not pleasant. Um, so yeah, find, don't just accept that as a problem. On one hand, look for gear which is going to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, comfortable and less likely to cause those sorts of chafing problems. On the other hand, body glide. Body glide, Vaseline, aqueous cream, all those sorts of things do a great job of just starting to grease the wheels a little bit, which makes all the difference from my point of view. Okay, one thing I haven't spoken about today um, in any great deal is how you can just make subtle additional changes to your running technique to make those longer runs that little bit more comfortable. And that for us bigger guys is super important. So the top comment down below, I've actually left a link um, to a video which will make all the difference for your running technique for your next long run. So do go and check that one out. And I'll see you in the very next video.